the UC's Five Front War, and who is it against? That is the topic of today's video. My name is Craig Meister. I'm a college admissions coach. You can learn more about me and how you can work with me one-on-one -on -one throughout the entire college admissions process on my website, which is collegemeister.com. And if you're interested in learning about whether or not you are or your student is on track for selective college admission, I encourage you to go over to my free three-minute online assessment at areyouontracktogetin.com. Again, that's areyouontracktogetin.com. Uh, and once you complete that assessment, your results will be emailed to you right away, and they will help you clarify whether you are or your student is on track for selective college admission in the United States of America. So the University of California system is one that for years has been very well regarded, decades, as on the cutting edge of research and discovery. And in particular, of course, UC Berkeley, UCLA, UC San Diego, and to some extent, University of uh, California, uh, Santa Barbara, have all been very much in demand destinations, not just from Californians themselves who are looking for an undergraduate education, but also from individuals from around the world because of the incredible respect scholars, lay people have had through the decades about the quality and the uh, excellence, frankly, of the UC system, the University of California system. And of course, there are other UCs as well. There's UC Irvine. There, there are others. But those are the ones that I've mentioned are the ones that are the most preeminent uh, institutions that have been very, very popular and very, very well respected for years. But while this was happening uh, in the last, frankly, since the 70s, and if you go back to the affirmative action case uh, all the way back in the beginning in California with the medical school. It was a UC school, of course, that this happened with. Um, and so always since uh, there have been schemes to try to uh, socially engineer a different society, the UCs have been also at the forefront of that. And that's very important context because... There have been individuals and power centers within the University of California system since the 1970s who have been uh, very openly working toward creating a different UC system by populating the UC student body and, frankly, the faculty. But let's stay focused on the, the UC student body and, of course, the administration as well. But, again, my job, my focus is on who is getting admitted into the UCs, and that's what we're hyper-focusing on today. There have been uh, individuals at work since the 1970s, maybe even earlier, but, but, but very outwardly, openly, since the 1970s, within the UC system, attempting to alter the demographics of the UC student population across the board. Uh, and every time this question of... Should the UCs change the way in which they evaluate students in order to create a new uh, demographic back, a breakdown of the undergraduate student population at the UCs has come to the public of California, i.e. the voters, the people who are the largest constituency in California, the actual general citizenry, the residents of California – the residents of California have voted down affirmative action in California. Uh, they, they have stated again and again that they do not want uh, admission based on race in California. Now, last year in the United States of America, a Supreme Court ruling, not just for California, but for the entire United States of America came down. And in the run up to that Supreme Court ruling, if you kept your finger on the pulse of the media, you would have noticed there were many articles alluding to the fact that Michigan, California, a couple other states have been hamstrung from performing affirmative action 
for a number of years because of their voters or legislation passed in their state or whatever. And we can learn from these universities, these public universities, what happens to certain populations when affirmative action is not a tool in the toolkit of admissions officers. And the general moral of these articles or these news reports was it's very hard to get the numbers of particular student populations, most notably uh, Black Americans and Hispanic Americans, but also in the case of California mentioned multiple times has been uh, Native Americans, to the numbers that the individuals running things at the UCs would like. And so they've had to become very creative. I mean, I'm just summarizing now, but they've had to become very creative. This was written in the articles and the news reports themselves. They've worked very hard on different schemes, different programming, different uh, initiatives in order to work those numbers back to where they want them to be or where they feel like they should be. And and most of the time, this is related to what, what uh, demographically speaking, is the overall representation maybe of the, the numbers of those populations within the state. Uh, but in other cases, it's just to get to, to a higher number because different individuals or power centers within the UCs believe that the numbers are too low. But the general thrust of these articles, news media reports, has been it's very hard to have undergraduate student populations, or even graduate, but let's focus again, since I focus on undergraduate, let's focus today on undergraduate. It's very hard to get undergraduate student populations uh, of the demographic breakdown that the individuals at the UCs want them to be without the tool of affirmative action. Now, then in June, 2023, affirmative action was effectively outlawed once and for all in the United States. I have done a previous video about uh, how colleges are working their way around that and are violating the spirit of the majority opinion of the Supreme Court. Uh, So that, of course, hit California public institutions as well. Uh, So, But before that even happened, one of the schemes... One of the initiatives that the UC system, and the UC system, by the way, these days is under the auspices of the leadership of a gentleman by the name of Dr. Michael V. Drake. He is the president of the University of California, but each individual campus has its own chancellor. It's such a massive system. It's a huge system of a very uh, well-supported public universities throughout the state of, of, of California. The UCs, prior to the Supreme Court ruling in 2023, already were performing multiple, you know, somersaults in order to get around what their own voters in the state of California had prevented them from doing, which is admitting student on the basis, admitting students on the basis of race, performing affirmative action, because it had been effectively and very explicitly, at least on two occasions, outlawed in California. So the administrators at the UCs ideologically completely separate and apart from the majority of of voters in the state of California, set it upon themselves in a very zealous manner. I mean, that's really the word, zealous manner and righteous manner, in their opinion, to uh, find a way around what they deem to be an incorrect decision by the voters for many years now in California to still work to improve the numbers of certain demographic groups grow the, the numbers of certain demographic groups groups within the undergraduate population within the UC system, particularly, of course, within the most selective UCs, UC Berkeley, UCLA, UC San Diego, and UC Santa Barbara, but all of them, of course. Um, so that is sort of the, the context I want to start with. This is a complex story. It's a multiple campus story, and it's a very big university system story. So they had already been working on this prior to the affirmative action basically being outlawed in the United States last year. Now, as I mentioned, again, you can watch the previous video. I'll link it below where I talk about how colleges continue to consider race and admission. And that's very much true. Uh, But UCs had already gone well beyond what most private and public institutions in the United States are now uh, grappling with in terms of tricks and, and schemes in order to get the demographics the way they want to want to get the demographics. And one of the ways in which the UC system has 
very intentionally gone about uh, diversifying in their, that's the word they would use, but I would call it sort of more along the lines of sort of just basically creating sort of like a caste system of certain demographic groups. One of the ways in which they've done it is not by in any way putting a thumb on the scale for one student and his or her race or his or her sex or his or her income in particular. No, no, no. One of the schemes that the UC system uses in order to affect the change they want to see in the world, i.e. the change they want to see in the demographics of the UCs, is they do not in any way, shape, or form officially or even implicitly discriminate against individuals or discriminate for individuals and their individual race. Because again, that or, or sex, even. that would be the race in particular is, of course, outlawed in California. And now it's doubly outlawed officially if you're following the Supreme Court ruling from last year in the United States. But what they've done over a number of years, and this has been particularly true since the UCs went test blind, which is a politically incorrect way of saying test free for first year admission. Uh, this happened several years ago. And it was coinciding roughly with the time period of multiple colleges, almost all colleges almost in the United States, going test-free temporarily for the um, period intersecting with the beginning of the COVID uh, emergencies, as well as the 2020 racial reckoning. Uh, as it is often referred to in the United States of America, it was roughly at that time that the UCs uh, really started to ramp up one of their tricks in order to, or the, one of the, their latest tricks, let's put it that way, in order to create the diversity or the demographic breakdown of the student population at the UCs that they wanted to see. And this trick was in no way targeted toward John, the applicant from Orange County's race or his sex, but it was very much targeted at John and his John's school and that school's performance. And uh, the and and when I say the school's performance, you know, what is the what is the general performance of the school and the uh, and the uh, breakdown of the overall performance of the the mass of students graduating from his school. And this is, a tr of course, true across the board. Also, what is the general demographics of that school? That's That was the trick. That was the workaround, basically. So basically what the UC system has relied on quite heavily over the last three to five years has been an explicit attempt to profile students based on the community slash school they are applying from. So there's no explicit discrimination, pro or con, against John the applicant. There is, however, very explicit thumbs on the scales for and against John based off of the school he is applying from. This is very critical for your understanding of the UC's five front war against um, certain demographic groups. And multiple, as you can see, five distinct demographic groups in the state of California. I have done a previous video about how you are being profiled. I will also link to that profile video below because that basically tells the tale specifically of how your application, this is true at universities across the United States, public and private, how your chance of getting into certain particularly selective colleges is very much impacted by your high school profile. The UCs just did it on steroids, basically. And they also did it with the tool of being test-free, which basically untied the last hand behind their back. They are now operating with two hands because by being test-free, the only real individual objective measure that the UCs consider when deciding whether or not to accept John or Juan or Dijon or whoever is um, the student's grade point average. 
I mean, that, of course, there are other objective things, like what were the courses that these students took? And also, uh, what were his or her extracurricular activities? But those are more subjective, of course. Subject extracurricular activities, that's a much more subjective measure, as as are uh, uh, essays and what, what are known as, in, in the UC system, the PIQs, the personal insight questions. They are much more subjective and much more considered an art today than when I started doing this, uh, when they weren't even PIQs at that time, they were essays. But um, at that time, they were you know, assess based off of the standard or traditional way of assessing writing, which was, is this well-written? Is the point being conveyed? These days, the PIQs are assessed in a much more subjective manner that is not necessarily aligned with one's ability to communicate at the college level. Let's just put it that way. So the real last bastion of objectivity is the student's grade point average, because remember also the UCs don't require, only in rare cases do they even ask for, and this is usually out-of-state kids I found, but um, letters of recommendation or maybe for very specific programs. The vast, vast swath of the students applying to the UCs are not having even letters of recommendation submitted and frankly, not even official high school transcripts submitted. They are self-reporting on the UC application their course names and their grades. So it's all authored by the student. There is no input directly from the high school, but the high school is very well known to the college in question, the university campus in question that is reviewing the student's application. That is the that is the, the real deal. The colleges, whether UC Irvine, UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, UC Berkeley, whatever it might be, they know the colleges the students are applying to. They know them, they, they know the high schools, excuse me, that the students are applying from, and they know them very well demographically in terms of racial breakdown, is it Asian, what percentage Asian, what percentage white, what percentage Hispanic, what percentage black, but they also know it demographically in terms of income levels of the students, who are the general population of that high school, and they also know it based off of how the school performs on standardized assessments that, of course, are not sent officially to the UC uh, schools as a part of the application, but are publicly available information about how many students at this school perform above this level in math or are proficient in math or are proficient in reading and how many are graduate? All, all this data is out there publicly. So, so the UC admissions readers, the application readers, the deciders within the UC system at each individual campus as you apply to them, they are very well aware of the demographics of those schools in every which way, shape, and form. That has played an increasing role over the last three to five years at the UCs. And this is why I say uh, the UCs are basically waging an uncontested, by the way, five front war against different demographic groups in the in the state of California in particular. But I mean, it's applicable and extrapolatable uh, throughout the, the world. But of course, the UC system has also reduced the numbers of non-California residents who've been getting in overall. Uh, over the recent years as well. So this is a mainly a story about California residents being overtly waged war upon by the UC system and the way in which it reads applications. Now, you may be saying, Craig, you're talking quite a bit. Uh, you're not really sharing a lot of evidence. Well, I have no desire to show the, share the evidence. You can read evidence. You can read stories about it because it's all out there, publicly available. Um, but long story short, the way it works is this. If you're applying to a UC from an underperforming school with a high black or Hispanic student population. And there could be a handful of whites and Asians there too, but let's say it's majority Hispanic and or black and it's underperforming as in, in terms of its uh, graduating population or it's assessed student population, the high school has below average in math, below average in reading, whatever. And you perform Anywhere above that average, you are considered an in-demand candidate at a UC. However, if you go to one of the highest performing high schools, public or private, in the state of California, and it happens to be a majority white or Asian student population, well, of course, there can and should hopefully be blacks and, and Hispanics there. It's a very diverse state, so it's not likely that there are no Hispanics or Blacks, but there, let's say there's a minority of Blacks and Hispanics at that school. And you are 
performing far better than that student who was above average at that low performing school, but you are still not as high up on the totem pole within your school as that student was at his or her school, you will not have the advantage that the student has at the school that's lower performing. And in fact, you may have individually learned much more. You have have, have engaged in a much more rigorous curriculum. Your overall grade point average may be higher. You might, you may have performed better outside the classroom as well. All those things don't amount to as much as the student who's performing relatively well, higher than you, at the low performing school that also is majority black and or Hispanic. So that's that's it. That's basically it. So who is this discriminating against? Well, it's discriminating against a lot of people. The war is being waged against a lot of students and therefore a lot of families throughout the state of California. I just want to summarize it briefly who this five front war is against. Number one, it is certainly against whites. Individuals who are also known as Caucasians, if you are white, um, you are likely to be in a situation right now where the UCs are waging a war against you in terms of letting you in to the most selective UC campuses in particular. Uh, the war is against Asians, number two, Asians. Now, this is uh, this is general. You know, obviously, there are very much the there are white students who are extremely poor and or extremely poor performing who happen to go to schools that are very low performing uh, and they fit right in in some cases in terms of their performance level or, you know, you know, um, and so those students are, if they're performing low, they're not going to benefit from this. So I'm not saying it's a, it's a war against all whites or all Asians or the next three groups that I'm going to talk about, but Overall, the whole scheme is developed to be a war against the five demographic groups I'm talking about. Whites, number one. Asians, number two. Because overall, at the macro level, whites and Asians are performing pretty well, if not a quote-unquote above average, in the state and state and state and schools, both public and private, that are majority white and Asian are the ones that are generally being waged war against in this scheme by the UCs, that the UCs are particularly seeking out students from the average to low performing schools, which also happen to be schools that are majority Hispanic and or black. Uh, third group, men. Now you say may say men or males. Uh, um, there are a lot of other words for, I guess, cis, there's all these different words now for what a man is, but let me just break it down. Men. Why men? Well, there's a lot of ongoing studies that have proven that generally speaking over time, men did better on the standardized test than they do with grade point average. Um, so uh, all things being equal, when you remove e any consideration of the SAT or ACT uh, at all, whether you're black, white, Hispanic, blue, green, you name it, or purple, um, if you are a male on average, if you and traditionally for decades, men did better on the SAT and ACT. Of course, the tests themselves changed a lot over the years to try to change that. But overall, men often um, are more. I have found men are far more likely to have average to low GPAs, but very high SAT scores than girls or ladies or women or whatever words they have for that now. Uh, so as a result, when you remove cons any consideration of the SAT or ACT from the admissions process, you are at that point waging a war against men who are able to often skim through a, a high school career getting two seven GPAs or three O GPAs, but somehow are able to sit for the SAT and get a 1500 or 1480 um, at a higher incidence level than a girl or a, a lady. I don't know why that is. I'm not into that actual weeds of the, the the mechanism behind that but that is just a fact that's just, that's well known that so when you remove the SAT and ACT you're you're waging war basically against men writ large regardless of their race or demographics or their income level then the fourth group are middle and upper class individuals when i talk middle and upper class i'm not talking about their classiness i don't know how classy they are but i'm talking about their uh their economic level pure and simple i'm not i'm just talking about their family income uh whether you're black, you're white, you're Hispanic, you're a Native American, Asian, 
if you are middle or upper class Californian, you are being waged war against. Because in most cases, if you're middle or upper class, you most likely go to a higher performing uh, public school and or you are going to a private or parochial school um, that gives you more personalized attention. And uh, obviously not all private schools are good either, but a lot of them are pretty good and on average stronger than an average public school. So um, again, this is uh, cutting across all race race groups at this point. If you can find yourself in an upper class financial or middle class financial situation, it's more likely you are being waged war against by the UC system. And then finally, the fifth group are what I call so many strivers. Students who are striving and families who are striving. It, it, it affects all income groups. If you are smart and you just happen to be down and out financially, uh, let's say you're quite broke financially, but you're a smart person, you want the best for your child, and you've decided to take on three jobs in order to get your child in the local Catholic school as opposed to sending them to the horrible public school in your neighborhood. You're a striver. You could be Hispanic, you could be black, I don't know where you're from, or you could be anything. But you're striving for a better future for yourself, your family, and your child tomorrow. And you're and you're working three jobs to get your child into a better school so that he or she's not beaten up every other day, or that he or she is not uh, enduring the the pains of a classroom with way too many students in it. So you want them to go to a smaller, let's say, private or Catholic school or whatever. Um, you're striving, and and there are many individuals, of course, that are black and Hispanic who find themselves in the situation because the the poorest demographic groups in the state of California are. Uh, Native American, Black, and Hispanic. So it goes to figure that those who are striving out of the worst economic conditions are most likely actually Black, Hispanic, and Native American. But so let's let's extrapolate that out. The the fifth group that war is being waged against are the strivers of all income levels who are trying for a better future for their children, who are trying to get their children in a more rigorous school, a higher performing school, a school with a school with better uh, behaved students a school that is safer, a school with a lower uh, teacher-student ratio, all, you know, all these things. And that I don't care what color you are or what income you are. If you really care about your child, you're probably trying for that. Obviously, if you have more money and, and resources at your disposal, you're, you're probably able to achieve it. But if you're uh, in a position of not having that much money, um, it's harder for you to achieve it, but it's sometimes still achievable in some way, shape, or form. You can scrap together scholarships or through the church or through your community organization or through some other charitable, uh, you know, so to get to get them into a good private school. Or maybe you'll get a financial aid or a scholarship at a local Los Angeles high-performing private school for, you know, individuals of your background. Or maybe your your cousin works there um, in, in, a, in a position, and as a result, you get tuition remission or something, or he or she can hook you up with something. The long story short, the strivers, the people who are trying to grab onto a vine and climb higher, these and then have somehow found themselves or their students in a better performing school than they otherwise would be in, but are now in those schools and are not at the very top. Maybe they're at the very top of those schools, but maybe they're sort of in the 50th percentile to 75th percentile of those schools, or maybe they're in the lower 50th percentile of those schools, but they're still in a much healthier, happier higher performing and joyful environment and learning environment, but they're not at the very tippity top of it. Those kids are getting blasted because on the high school profile, it's very clear that those high schools that the, the, that the UC systems have access to from all the data that they have in their disposal on the back end, it's very clear that those students are obviously not going to get any up plus grade for the fact that they themselves are black or Hispanic. But they're also going to get hit hard from the fact that they're in a higher performing school. And if they're not at the very top of that high performing school, the very tippity top, uh, depending on the school that you're applying to in this UCs, they, they are getting really hit on both ends in the sense that they're learning much more than maybe their peers in their neighborhood at the local public school. But because on average they're lower than the very top of the class at their new private or uh, school, uh, or maybe the family even saved up a lot of money to try to afford a house or an apartment in a better school district. So it may not even be at a private school, be a better district across town. And they were able to move into this new apartment just for the next four years for high school, let's say, because they know they want their child in a better school. Well, now at that better school, they're maybe in the lower half of those performing, or maybe even they're in the 75th percentile, but they're not in the top 10%, in which case the, the most selective UCs, it's still going to be real hard, but maybe it will, that will help them at the sort of the more 
middle group of UCs in, in ways that it wouldn't have helped. So in many ways, it's it's really hurting them from both ends. So the strivers, the strivers amongst the California population. So there is a five front war being waged against white California, California high school students, Asian California high school students, male California high school students, middle and upper class economically uh, high school students in California, and also any and all strivers of all income and race groups, Californians. Um, because if you're striving, it's it's you, you really could actually be striving out of your lane, as the UC system would probably put it if they were being honest, which is they want you to be with your type. They want you to be in your neighborhood so they can judge you in the context of the community you grew up in. Uh, but you may just have to endure, you know, being maltreated or <laughs> not learning as much in that school. But as long as you're in the top 10 percent at that school, you'd be better off in the eyes of the UCs than learning 10 times as much uh, as a middle or an average student at a better school in a different neighborhood or in a different in a private school. So this five front war is being waged against uh, these five groups of Californians and nobody is doing anything about it. And <laughs> that's the thing that's the most amazing to me is that no one is doing anything. It's just happening. It's happening. And it's because it is being done, of course, in sort of this quasi clandestine manner, a uh, clandestine manner. It's it's being done sort of where they, they are all very proud in the emissions community. Every year they get together at NACAC or IAC, International NACAC or other conferences. You know, everyone is really proud to be a marquee speaker um, at a conference uh, talking about the need for greater diversity, equity, and inclusion. But when it comes right down to showing how you're achieving it, all of these admissions leaders become much more closed. Uh, they're, they're much less open about how they're going to share with how they're accomplishing what they're accomplishing. Um, and all they'll say is, again, in an NPR article, they'll say something along the lines, it's, it's been it's a lot of work. It's been a lot of work to do this, but we're making it happen. We're trying our best. We're still at the numbers, not at the numbers we want, but we're doing our best. But they don't really sort of show sunlight on what they're doing. And this, what I described today is what they're doing. They're using internally created high school profiles for every high school in California and ultimately around the world. But the ones they're much more familiar with are the high schools in the state of California, both public and private. And they are profiling the students according to that profile and seeing how they sort of rank at that school. And so the, the end result is you could be going to the worst public school in San Francisco or LA, the worst one. You could have learned next to nothing, but you could be at the top of your class at that school. And the UC system doesn't care about your specific race uh, or, or income, but obviously most likely you don't have much income because you're at that school, God forbid. And um, you, but because your school's so under, uh, low performing and you are achieving at the top, you are gonna get in much easier to multiple very prestigious UC schools than Jane at the top performing private school or public school in San Francisco or LA. She's learned so much more than you. She's been in a much more conducive environment for learning for four years, but she's basically in the 70th percentile at her high school. There's about 30% of the kids are doing better academically at her high school or have other sort of interesting exotic things that put them ahead of you. Uh, you. But it's mainly the GPA and the, and the rigor of the curriculum at, at her high school. So even though she learned much more than that kid across town or across the state, she is getting slammed because she's going to a higher performing high school, a high school that demographically... the colleges also know about the demographic breakdown and maybe that school also is vast majority Asian where Jane goes and the school that the other student goes to is majority Hispanic or black. The UCs all know about that. So again, and, and the thing that I just want to make very clear is that the UCs know they're doing this, but they're not really overtly advertising it on television that they're doing this. They're sort of hinting at the fact that we work every day to create a more equitable and inclusive environment, but they sort of stop there with their public pronouncements. But behind closed doors, this is what they're doing. This is what they're doing. And again, I, I and this is why there has not been a more concerted or overt pushback is because 
how do you fight something that isn't publicly admitted to? Um, and but but many people are involved. This is not something that one person. This is not just being done by Dr. Michael V. Drake. In fact, he's not doing any of it. He's just the president of the University of California. It's being done on a campus by campus basis. So there are individuals on every UC campus that are involved in the scheme. So it's not so hard to figure this out. There are multiple parties that are involved. So it's not like you have to find the one person doing it. It's not just one person pulling the strings. There are many, dozens of individuals pulling the strings and doing this. And to me, that's the most odd thing is that it's being done. It's being done against the will of Californians uh, who have voted time and again not to consider immutable characteristics in the emissions process. Um, but it's happening, and it's happening over uh, ongoing in an ongoing manner. And so far, it's like shadow boxing. No one has been able to or willing to or has the verve to stand up and talk against or speak against or call out really what is going on here in a way that other than just like me pontificating about it because I just want you to be aware of it. I want you to be aware of it. So why am I doing this video? Obviously, I would like some individuals with more uh, ability and <laughs> interest and maybe resources to maybe actually uh, try to turn this ship around because I personally, as I've stated in a previous video, which is linked below, the, the one about how colleges continue to consider race and emissions, my personal value system, I've been very honest about this, is that one's immutable characteristics, things that someone cannot change about themselves, what color they were born, what income level they were born into. You At, at 17, you don't control how wealthy your family is. You know, um, the education level of your family you don't control. Uh, you, that's something that's been put upon you by circumstance of birth. You don't control your sex at 16, 17, your race, your income level, or your parents' um, uh, um education level. So these are what I would deem to be immutable characteristics of college applicants. Uh, it is my belief that it is unfair and wrong to judge people based off of immutable characteristics in the admissions process. I believe that students should be considered on the basis of their actions and their behaviors. Yeah. And even contextually, you know, obviously if you go to a school with no AP classes, you shouldn't be downgraded too much, if at all, for the fact that there are no AP classes. You, If you took the most rigorous classes at your school, that shows a lot of gumption um, where, wherever you go to school. Now, again, I'm not – now, if you're considering SATs or ACTs along that, at that point, it's very possible the kid who didn't go to an AP school or an IB school could have lower on average SAT or ACT scores, at which point, you know, right now the UCs are not considering test scores, but at other schools – that can definitely hurt a kid who's, through circumstance, gone to a weaker school. And I understand the arguments as to why you would maybe put the thumbs on the scale for a kid who uh, maybe wasn't given as many opportunities. But overall, um, there, there is a lot of agency still in the individual. And that that is my general approach. I see it every day when students are crafting essays. I work with students throughout the years um, who are first-generation college students who come from very low socioeconomic, back, very poor economic backgrounds. Um, and I've also worked with people who are worth billions of dollars. And guess what? When you work with students of all different economic levels, of all different colors, guess what you see? Students are ultimately responsible for their own behaviors. That's what you see. And that's why I have the philosophy I have, which is uh, I have seen extremely lazy billionaires white, Asian, others, Hispanic. <laughs> I've seen it all. And I and black actually. And I have also seen extremely hardworking, conscientious students who whose family may not have $500 in the bank of all of all backgrounds. And I've seen everything, every combination and permutation in between. And so I'm a big believer in ultimately looking at the individual when making an emissions decision, not looking at the individual's group or community when making an admissions decision. So the reason I'm doing this video is I would like as many people to be aware of the fact that I still believe in personal responsibility and actions and doing the best with what you've been dealt. And that should ultimately, I think, play the largest role 
in your chances of getting admission to a university. And, and of course, hopefully the university accepting you will be accepting you because they think you can thrive and succeed at that university as well. But the other reason I'm doing it is just for the, the lay person, like the majority of you, I want you to be aware of the fact that the UC admissions process is a very tightly controlled game. And I would argue it is a war against those five demographic groups we talked about today. And again, just to summarize, we're talking about whites, we're talking about Asians, we're talking about men, we're talking about middle and upper class individuals from families of economic means of middle and upper class. And we're talking about strivers of all colors and backgrounds economically. Those are the five fronts that the UC system is waging a war against. So if you happen to find yourself in, in one of those five demographic groups or multiple, um, you got to just be open eye, uh, wide eyed about uh, what you're getting into when you're applying to the UCs. I'm not saying you can't get in. You could still get in. But the, the, de the deck is stacked very much against you the more of those demographic buckets you, you uh, fit into. Um, and beyond that, you know, th this is just something, again, for edification purposes and edifying my audience. I want you to be aware that this is the reality. This is the reality. I would I would encourage any UC spokesman uh, at the overall University of California system with Dr. Drake's office or any individual UC campus to produce a video or state that this is not, in fact, the case. You can't do it because it is the case. And they will not do it. They can't refute what I've stated because even though I don't have access to all the data they have on the back end, it's very clear from admissions decisions over the last several years that this is exactly what is happening. And so you just, I just want everyone, no matter what your racial demographics are, what your sex demographics are, what your income level is, you have access to YouTube. You're hearing my voice right now. You are watching this video I want you to know of this information so that you can make the right choices for you. Because like I said earlier, you have personal responsibility for you. You need to look out for number one. You have agency. D despite what you may have heard through the years, you have free will. And the reason I did this video today for 40 some minutes now is so that you can understand you have free will, you can... Now navigate the admissions process to the UCs more effectively, knowing this information potentially, especially if you're younger or if you have children who are younger, maybe you make plans accordingly if you really want to get into the UCs. You may just be edified by this and this could be in the back of your mind when you go to vote or when you go to your job each day. It's just something to know about. Or you know, maybe this turns you against the UCs and you realize that you don't necessarily want to be in an environment that's going down this road because when you do extrapolate this out, what we've talked about today, this war against these five groups that the UCs are, is, is waging, uncontested right now, um, when you extrapolate it out, I do not believe it bodes very well for either the state of California overall or any of the UC campuses. I don't think this bodes well for the, any of the UC campuses because what, what they're selecting for at the UCs now is very much anathema to what excellent universities have selected for ever, ever, and, and, and remained excellent universities. All right, so I'm not saying that there have, has not been discrimination at universities throughout the entire history of the United States. There has been, and in different shapes and forms, but at no point can you continue to do this year after year, decade after decade, and have ultimately healthy, truly diverse uh a truly inclusive and truly excellent academic institutions when you select students like this. You can't do it. You just can't do it. And this is not against any one demographic group. It's just against the system that I am speaking. I'm speaking truth to power. I'm fighting the system as much as I can with my one voice. I just want you to be aware of it. And you ultimately have to take it what, for what it's worth for you. Now, again, I'm sure a lot of individuals watching this video will be like, Craig, Ew, I don't like you. You know, I, I don't agree with anything you stated. And you have every right to that because as of right now, the United States of America is still a free country and you can have every right to, to that opinion. Uh, and you can comment as such and I encourage you to do so civilly below this video if you highly disagree. But if you agree, you can also, I encourage you to comment as well. Or if you have some other insight or for, from what you've learned today, by all means, feel free to comment as well below. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was thought provoking for you. 
And if you enjoyed it, I encourage you to give it a thumbs up or also consider subscribing to my channel. And if you would like to work with me one-on-one -on -one throughout or even for just part of the college admissions process, I encourage you to go to my website, which is collegemeister.com. Until next time, stay safe, stay well, and most importantly, stay stress-free throughout the entire college admissions process.